Mrs. Green. Have your Bibles open to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter number 1. We'll begin there this morning and then move to another passage as well. But Matthew chapter 1. Thank you again for being here this morning. I love Christmas time. Hopefully your houses are all decorated, your trees are all up, and hopefully we have no Scrooges here this morning. As you can tell around First Baptist Church, we love Christmas. We love the festivity, we love the lights, we love the Christmas music, but we love Jesus. And that's the reason for Christmas, Jesus. Matthew chapter 1, if you have your Bibles there this morning, you'll notice on our stage it looks a little bit different this morning. That is because tonight at 6 o'clock p.m. we're having our Christmas musical here at First Baptist Church. Full choir, orchestra, you heard one of the songs this morning from this, the program tonight, along with some video presentation as well. 6 o'clock p.m. here at First Baptist Church. And that's why we have these things, hospital bed in this kind of living room. It's not just so that I am comfortable while I preach, though if I need to sit down, I will. Um, it's for a purpose. That's for our musical tonight, 6 o'clock p.m., and uh, we're going to uh, see the greatest story ever told. Now, I think if you come back, you'll enjoy that tonight. A lot of work has been put into it, and I think it'll be a blessing to you. Matthew chapter 1, if you look, please, in verse number 21, where the Bible says, is the angel speaking to Joseph. Joseph, of course, has been bothered by what has taken place with his fiance, to use a borrow a current term for that process back then. His fiance, she is discovered or found to be with child. We looked at the other night what Joseph's response was, and it was to just obey it. But while the angel is, is speaking to Joseph, the angel says this, verse 21, and she, that is Mary, shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now, all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. I don't want you to miss the fact this morning that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Jesus is God. We'll look at that this morning. He came down to earth as a babe in a manger, just like God said it would happen. We looked at this last Sunday. What God says will always happen. It may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, but if God says it, it is true. It is as good as done. You can take it to the bank, you can write checks on it. It is good. God is truth. And what he says will happen. And right here we have the fulfillment of the prophecy. Back in Isaiah chapter 7, verse number 14, we first have this prophecy where it says, The Lord himself shall give you a sign. God says, I'll give you a sign myself. You may pick a sign, and sometimes we pray for signs, right? Lord, if this is your will, then help a rainbow to appear in the sky as I drive south on Dixie Highway. And then I know you're in this, God. Lord, if this is really your will, then help a bird land on my awning or something like that. And I've known people to pray for those signs before. But in Isaiah chapter 7, God says, I'll give you a sign. I'll let you know that I'm working. A virgin shall conceive. Never been done before, never been done since. The Virgin Mary had known no man till the Holy Ghost came upon her and gave her to be with child of the, as the Son of God. And he is the Son of God. And then the Bible says they will call his name Emmanuel. And Isaiah stops there and Matthew interprets what that means. God with us. We've looked at some sermons this particular Christmas season on that truth. God with us. What a humbling thought. God with us us. What an amazing thought, God with us. Boy, we would think it quite remarkable if somebody famous stopped by. Back up, up until a, a year ago or so, I would watch occasionally NBA games, NBA basketball games. This year, I took a little hiatus from that, but I enjoy watching their skill set. Now, I don't want, watch college basketball that much. I prefer the NBA. Now, some of you who like college will throw some barbs my direction. You'll say, well, there's real skill over here, and, and they just play for the money. For sure they do. And if you paid me that kind of money, I'd play for the money too. <laughs> I wouldn't be any good at it. And there are certain players that I prefer over other players, and sometimes you'll get in good nature bantering about certain players, and, well, that guy's a punk. In my book, they're all punks. But they're all, I'm sure they're decent people, right? But, but if LeBron James, who is right now touted to be one of the best, if not the best basketball player, once again, I'm not looking for an argument. 
He is not my favorite player, but some of you like him, some of the younger generation likes him. That if he were to show up to my house today at lunchtime, first he'd have a h- trouble getting into my house because I have a normal sized door. He's a very tall man. You better believe that tonight during the musical, I would mention that LeBron James stopped by my house. Whether you like him or hate, hate him as a famous basketball player, if he stopped by, you would talk about it. Now, some of you are like, oh, that's right. I'd shut the door in his face. <laughs> sure you would. Sure you would. If you can reach up there. <laughs> if someone famous stopped by, boy, we would talk about that. But to think that the God of the universe sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, in the flesh, God with us. That is the reason for this season. God with us. Using that kind of concept, I'd like you to, if you would, turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter number 4. Because God has been down here on earth, because Jesus Christ came in the flesh, what are some of the ramifications? What are some of the results of that? We've looked at some of the responses, and we have a few more of those to go. We've looked at uh, the reminder. We've looked at, we'll look at this Thursday night, the reality of that. But today... I want to look at an aspect that we have because Jesus Christ came down in the flesh. In Hebrews chapter number 4, the Bible tells us this beginning in verse number 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched, with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Friends, I wonder if you ever have a time of need in your life. Some say, yeah, pastor, every day I wake up is a time of need. And when I lay my head down, there's a time of need. Every single day is a time of need. The Bible here in Hebrews chapter 4 tells us because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came in the flesh, he is now relatable. This morning, I want to look at this concept of Jesus Christ being relatable because of God with us. Lord, I thank you for this time. I ask that you would guide us and direct us. Lord, give me the words to say. Lord, I've tried to study and and be true to your word. I pray that if there's something I have in my notes that would not be helpful this morning, you'd strike it from my mouth and from this service. But Lord, I pray your spirit would touch us, your truth would change us. Lord, I don't know all the needs this morning, all the issues and problems, but I know that you do. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here discouraged or needs a touch from you, that you would touch them this morning. And Lord, I ask for anyone here who's not saved, never trusted you as their Savior, that today would be the day they turn to you in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. It seems as if we live in a time that everyone wants to be relatable. Old wants to relate with the young. Call it midlife crisis. You see teenagers dress one way, and before long you see adults dress that way too. Relate. You you find it in a sales presentation. A guy will come to your door, and he will try to relate to you and identify with you. Oh, you have what I need. Oh, you have kids. I can identify kids. Right? Oh, you have a house. I had a house once. They try to relate. Oh, look at that. You're married. I'm thinking about getting married. People try to relate. At church, people try to relate. Sometimes people will go through a particularly hard time. And a foolish person will say, oh, I know exactly how you feel. Now, the idea is not foolish, but that statement is foolish. You don't know exactly how they feel. But your attempt, our attempt, is to try to relate to somebody. I was talking to one of our dear members, dear saints, the other day, an older member, older than myself. I mentioned that right now, uh, it seems like all my mail is junk mail and has, has to do with a lot of credit card applications. Apparently, my credit is worthy enough to merit applications for more credit cards. I was saying, that's what I get. And they said this to me. They said, well, pastor, that's good. Just wait till you get old. 
because then all you get is applications for funeral spots and burial services. I don't know if that is true or not. That is what they said to me. I said, well, I'm thanking the Lord for my credit card applications. It lets me know I'm still young. Oh, look at that. I can still go buy something. People try to relate salesmen, uh, uh, young to old, old to young. In a tragedy, people try to relate. But the Bible tells us that our high priest, Jesus Christ, can actually relate to us. How is that possible? The Bible explains that to us. The Bible tells us because he came down to earth, he can relate to us. He has the unique ability to relate to us. The Bible says he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He is uniquely able to relate to us. And this morning, I want to give us three points to show about Jesus Christ. First of all, I want us to notice that Jesus Christ is uniquely qualified Jesus Christ is uniquely qualified. Jesus Christ came to earth, and he came in a way that no one since, before and after, has come. He came born of a virgin. Because he was born of a virgin, he did not have a sin nature. You see, because of the sin of Adam in the Garden of Eden, we all are, we are all cursed by sin. We are all prone to sin. We have a natural tendency to want to, in our flesh, to not do right. What I'm saying is that from an early age, you can see this natural tendency, can you not? You can see it in a young child. When after our son Johnny was born, and my poor kids get used in illustrations, they have to be careful what they say and do at home. Anything you say can and will be used to you in the next sermon illustration. They know this, and they're in junior church. Bless their heart. They'll be okay. Now, when Johnny was born, it was just a, a, a little, just a few moments after he was born, maybe an hour or so. And Doreen was holding him as a mother, and, and so as a father, I was going I, I to hold him and gave him, I think, to my mother as well. And Johnny, little Johnny, sweet little Johnny, when we pulled him away from his mother, I, to this day, believe he threw a temper tantrum. This is what he did. You be the judge. And you say, well, he doesn't know what he's thinking. He doesn't know what he's processing. We took him from his mother. He was sweet and happy and held this new child. And he curled up his hands into little fists like this. Sweet little Johnny. His face became red like my tie and began to, and began to wail and to scream. You say, he doesn't know what he was doing. He just, he just you know, until he went back into the arms of his mother. And then it stopped like a light switch. You be the judge. You be the judge. At an early age, you realize from children that they're bent, they're turned the wrong direction. Now, this is not a popular thought in culture. Culture says all kids are naturally good. They're only ruined by their surroundings. I introduce you to the Howell household where kids naturally want to break things and touch things they shouldn't and do things they're not supposed to do. From an early age, Johnny, James, Danielle, don't touch the electrical outlet. What is it about two holes in a wall that is like a black hole? I must touch. And my little finger fits right inside. If that doesn't fit, I can grab a paper clip. No, son, don't touch. It was at Christmas when they, one of the children was very young. They were in a little walker. Boy, I remember as an early parent, you're waiting for the day your kids can move, and then they start to move, and you wish they didn't move. But uh, I was in a walker just moving all over the place, and we had some Christmas decorations on like an ottoman in front of our couch. It was one of our children, I will not name which one the name was, went to touch it. And like parents, we said, no, don't touch that. They proceeded to touch it, and we kind of popped their hand a little bit, no, don't touch that. And then, like only a child can do, they looked up at us from their little walker and reached like this. <laughs> Naturally good? I don't think so. Except for Jesus. Yeah. 
Jesus is uniquely qualified as the son of God, born of a virgin. He came into this world sinless. His nature was not to sin. He is God. He is uniquely qualified. The Bible tells us that the son of God is uniquely qualified to intercede for us. Hebrews chapter 7, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. In a sense, Jesus is our Lord you're for us. He intercedes for us. He pleads for us. Satan is called the accuser of the, of the brethren, and he comes and accuses us. And you know what? His accusations are most likely relatively accurate, except the fact he's a liar. He doesn't have to make up too much about you or me to accuse us, but Jesus Christ, as the Son of God, as our high priest, intercedes for us. He defends us. Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of God. Understand, my friend, this babe born in a manger is no longer in a manger. You may see him in a, de, uh, depicted in a nativity set. You may even see him sometimes depicted on the cross. He is no longer in a manger or on the cross. He is at the right hand of God. He is God. He's at the right hand of God. Looking into Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. In fact, if you read in the book of Acts, Stephen, the very first martyr, as he is being stoned, looks up into heaven, and God supernaturally allows him to see straight into the heavens, not the sky, straight into the majesty of God's glory. And Stephen sees Jesus... By the throne of God. He makes a little mistake and he says out loud what he saw. And I say that mistake tongue in cheek. At that point when he said what he saw, those around him, the religious leaders of that day, were so angry they begin to gnash on him with their teeth. He stands as our substitute. John tells us, my little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, the substitute for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You see, Jesus is uniquely qualified. There is no one else who can do or has done or who will do what Jesus has done and does right now. He is uniquely qualified. But notice also this morning, he is uniquely sympathetic. Now, some of you have more sympathy than others. I am told that I don't have a lot of sympathy. I don't cry too much. Now, I don't say that men don't cry. All right? I, I, it's not, the Bible doesn't teach that either, all right? I do tell my boys there are some things that are not worth crying about. If you lose a game that you're playing, you don't cry about that. There's some tragedy in life where, where tears are appropriate. My wife once said to me, she goes, I think your emotions are broken. <laughs> I don't know what she meant by that. I thanked her. I said, honey, that's the nicest thing you ever said to me. <laughs> some of you are incredibly sympathetic. I think of Mrs. Dalton. Can I point you out, Mrs. Dalton? That's one of those rhetorical questions, Right? <laughs> Oh boy, a dear teacher uh, here at, at Bridgeport Baptist Academy, been here for many years, 19 and a half years I think it is here at Bridgeport Baptist Academy, and uniquely uh, uh, gifted to teach our students, but always sympathetic. In fact, if you need someone to shed tears with you, just go by Mrs. Dalton. She will shed tears with you. All right, as you walk by, for whatever reason, you lose a game, Mrs. Dalton will cry with you, no problem. Uniquely sympathetic. But Jesus Christ is the most sympathetic. And we notice a couple of things. One, the Bible says he felt our frailty. The Bible says that he was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. But he also, he had the feeling of our infirmities. Not just a head knowledge, but a feeling. And the other day, one of my children came in and said, ow, 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 ow. I said, what is wrong? I stubbed my toe. Now Listen. We stub our toes sometimes and we say the same thing. Ow, 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 ow. But as a good father, 
as a good father, as a devout father, as a loving father. I did not jump up from my chair. I did not even really move. I might have turned my head. Oh. Oh. That was all the ruckus was about? Your toe? You've got ten of them. If you lose one, you'll survive. You'll be okay. It's, I think I broke it, Dad. It's what, they, it's what they said to me. Once again, I didn't get out of my chair. I might have turned my head. Nope, looks fine. <laughs> As a medical professional, I'm uniquely qualified on all broken toes in my house. I have no idea if it's broken or not. Right? But the Bible tells us that Jesus felt our infirmities, not just a head knowledge, but a feeling. Boy, I've stubbed my toe before. It hurts. You've stubbed your toe. You're walking in the dark at night. Boom! You find the coffee table. Who put that thing there? Oh, it was me. Oh, oh man. Can't even blame my wife. My fault. Jesus Christ felt our frailty. He felt our pain. He felt the joy. I don't completely understand how that is possible, but the Bible says it's true. He was touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He's sympathetic. So that when we pray, when we go to Jesus, he knows and understands what we feel like. He and he alone can say, I know how you feel. I understand that problem. I feel your pain. I hear you. I know. Oh, sometimes someone will hit their funny bone. Oh, man, that'll just ring, ring you a good one, right? Someone else, oh, yeah, I've done that before. Yeah, but you didn't do it this bad. This was really, really, really bad. You only did it really bad. But when Jesus says, I know, the Bible says he knows. Isn't that amazing that the Son of God would be willing to feel what I feel? In a sense, what I could have done to be like Jesus in this regard is once my child came in and said, ow, 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 I could have gone into the room to the same place where he stubbed his toe, taken off my shoe, and kicked the same spot. And then I say, ow, 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 ow. Now I feel this with you. But that's what the Bible says that Jesus did when he came down to earth. He came down so that one, one reason he could feel, and he did feel our infirmities. One night, there was an evangelistic crusade. The one in charge of the Salvation Army, Booth Tucker was his name, was preaching on the sympathy of Jesus. And after the message that night, a man came to him and said, listen, if your wife had just died like mine has, and your babies were crying for their mother, you would never come back, and you wouldn't be saying what you're saying about the sympathy of Jesus Christ. Tragically, as the story goes, a few days later, Booth Tucker's wife was killed in a train accident. Her body was brought to Chicago, carried to the same, same place that Booth Tucker was preaching a little bit earlier. After the service, Booth Tucker looked down at his wife and turned to those attending and said this, the other day, a man told me that I wouldn't speak of the sympathy of Jesus if my wife had just died. He said, if that man is here this morning, I want to tell him that my Jesus Christ is still sufficient. Amen. My heart is broken, but it has a song put there by Jesus Christ. I want to, that man to know that Jesus Christ speaks comfort to me today. And you know why that's possible? Because Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. He has felt our frailty. Jesus Christ feels what we feel. He has faced our fears. When the Bible says he was tempted in all points like as we are, he has faced our fears. I take the Bible literally. All right? The Bible just not speaking uh, just in an idea. The Bible tells me he has faced our fears, doubt, discouragement. Yet Jesus Christ did not fail. He was without sin. 
yet without sin. Those three little words, yet without sin, tell me that my Jesus is uniquely sympathetic. Jesus is uniquely qualified, uniquely sympathetic, but last to this morning, Jesus Christ has uniquely provided for us. This verse tells us two things, and Matthew tells us one. First of all, he gives us a tremendous promise. His name, uh, they said to name him Jesus, he shall save their people from their sins. Jesus Christ has provided salvation. Because Jesus Christ came to earth, because he is uniquely qualified, Jesus Christ can bring and offer true salvation. There are a lot of false salvations out there. Go to this church and you can be saved. Get baptized and you can go to heaven. Give this and you can go to heaven. Do this and you'll be in paradise. But Jesus and Jesus alone offers true salvation. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be be saved. Believe that he came to earth in a true human form. Believe that he lived on this earth. Believe that he died on the cross and rose again. That's what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians. The gospel is, and now he lives forevermore. Jesus Christ brings us the promise of salvation, the promise of hope. Jesus Christ has uniquely offered us salvation. You're here in church this morning because of Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ, this church doesn't exist. My parents are Christians. Without Jesus Christ, I don't exist. Without Jesus Christ, homes would not be together today. Without Jesus Christ, lives would be upside down. Without Jesus Christ, businesses would have crumbled. Without Jesus Christ, this world would not be here. The Bible says, by him, all things consist. Without Jesus Christ, we don't have anything Jesus Christ has brought to us salvation. But the verse also gives us two other things. The verse says, because of this, we can boldly approach the throne of grace. Jesus Christ has not only given us a promise, he's given us prayer. Can you imagine if Jesus Christ in prayer was like Verizon? Have you had to call for customer service lately? Call it Verizon, call it Sprint, call it whatever company. Hopefully, when you call, you can understand what is being said. You're always put through a thousand different menus, are you not? If you're calling for service, press 1. If you're calling for sales, press 2. If you're calling because something's broken, press 3. If you don't know why you're calling, press 4. To hear these options again, press 9. Years ago, I learned and I read somewhere there are different sequences to break through these particular, um, these particular loops. And uh, there are certain key, and, and so I, I discovered in certain companies, um, and I won't tell you which one, there's one locally, that if you press the number zero 21 times, you get an operator. Now, it's not the same for every company. It was when I was setting up the phone system, I, I found out some of these things on, the, on these loops. And I was with somebody a little while back trying to get through some customer service, and they said, what are you doing? I said, well, just watch. Beep, 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 beep. They said, what? That's a mess. Beep, 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 beep. 21 times, started ringing. Got to an operator within about a minute and a half. There are other times you can wait for 20, 30, right? Or, or the worst, would you like a call back? In theory, it's a great idea, but somehow I always miss the call back. <laughs> can you imagine if prayer was like that? Hello, thank you for reaching heaven. You have reached an operator. Normal business hours are 8 to 5 central time. It's never the time zone you're in. For requests, press 1. For Thanksgiving, press 2. For complaints, press 3. All other inquiries, press 4 and wait. Your call will be answered in the order in which it was received. Can you imagine if that's what prayer was like? Oh, my goodness. What if God said this? All operators are currently busy. Please call back. We're experiencing an especially high number of calls right now. Can you imagine that? Yet the Bible says that we can boldly approach the throne of grace. Jesus has made a way of prayer for us. Because he came to earth, and that's what this passage says, he felt our infirmities, he's our high priest, therefore boldly approach the throne of grace. I can now go to God in prayer. And listen, Christian, we have the power of prayer. We talk about it. We lament about it. We request help in it. But do we use it? Do we use it? 
Oh, you may be quick to say, well, pastor, will you pray for me? And listen, if you ask me that, I do my best to pray for you. I have requests that I do every single day for people until I hear otherwise. But there have been times I've been guilty of failing to pray for somebody, have you? And we, we're quick to ask people, well, put this on the prayer list, put this here. Do you pray? Do, do we access this power? The Bible says, confess your faults one to another and to pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The Bible says that prayer does a whole lot in God's economy. Anybody can pray. If you're a believer, you can pray. You can pray while you're driving down the road. <laughs> Maybe we ought to pray if you're driving down the road. You can pray while you're at home. You can pray while you're laying in bed at night. You can pray. Anyone can pray. You ought to have a set time where you pray. But you know that Jesus Christ prays for us as well? Robert Murray McShane said this, If I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Yet distant makes, distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. You think about that? Your high priest is praying for you, making intercession for you. What do I fear? What can I not face? Because Jesus Christ has uniquely provided prayer. But he's also provided, as verse says, grace. The Bible says here, that let us therefore boldly come into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in that time of need. Paul had a problem, the Apostle Paul. There was a thorn in the flesh, the Bible says, a thorn that was apparently so bad that Paul prayed for three times for God to remove it. The Bible says thrice, he said, I asked, God, remove this thorn. You ever prayed for God to take something away? I have. I have. Sometimes there are things we go through, things we face, things we're walking through. We're like, God, this seems too much. God, can you take this away right here? I'm not saying you're not good, but Lord, this particular problem, this issue, would you take it away? And, and Paul had that issue, and he prayed three times, but he had this response from the Lord. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee. That same word grace we find in Hebrews chapter 4. And then he says this to equate this, for my strength, my grace is sufficient for my strength. His grace equals his strength, is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You want the power of Christ in your life? It is his grace that brings that power. Power to not only face life, but to enjoy life. Power to not only live, but to live abundantly. Power to not only survive, but to flourish. Jesus Christ brings unmistakable power to a believer's life. See, the Christmas story shows me that Jesus Christ is relatable to me. Now, some want to make him just like me, just like them. He gets angry like I get angry. No, Jesus is completely different. He's God. But he is relatable to us. Because of that relatability, I can live for God. I have no excuse. Because of the love, Jesus is relatable. Maria was a telephone operator. The wife of a Soviet army officer and the proud owner of a T-34 tank. Her husband was killed in World War, World War II and because he served in the military and was called a hero they gave her some money she sold her house took that money and bought a T-34 tank to go after the Germans though initially the unit that she joined was skeptical of this lady thinking it was nothing more than a publicity stunt their opinions, they said, quickly changed after the first battle, in which she eliminated numerous machine gun nests, artillery guns, and the soldiers who manned them. When her tank was hit and immobilized by heavy enemy fire, they tell us that she immediately jumped out of the tank to repair it. And after this first battle, because of her brave action, she was promoted to sergeant. 
Battle after battle, she drove her T-34 tank to defeat the Germans for revenge for her husband. Until finally there was a battle in January of 1944 where it caught up with her. And she was killed in battle. But not, however, before eliminated more machine gun nests, trenches, a self-propelled gun, and even more soldiers. She was killed because she was once again outside of her tank trying to fix it and get it back in battle. I read that story and she had written that she was doing this all for revenge. Revenge can be a powerful motivator. Revenge has the power to make you sell everything and buy a T-34 tank. But revenge doesn't have the power to motivate us to forgive, to heal, or to restore. But love does. And Jesus Christ did not come to earth because of revenge. God did not send Jesus here because of revenge. He sent him here because of love. And the Bible tells us that love never fails. Jesus was motivated by love when he left all he had in heaven to come to earth to fight the powers of sin and to death. Jesus motivated by love to feel our infirmities. Jesus motivated by love now in heaven interceding for us. And I'm so glad for the love of my Savior and the love of the Heavenly Father for God's so loved the world. My life is touched by the love of God. I wonder this morning if sometimes you're tempted to feel like you're hitting this thing all alone. My friend Jesus, he's relatable. I wonder if you're tempted to face your problems all by yourself. Jesus has offered prayer and power. We're not alone in this thing. Jesus, the Son of God, came to earth, and because of that, God with us, he is relatable. Lord, I thank you for loving us this morning. I thank you for the love of Jesus and your love in sending your Son. Lord, you've touched my life. Or I think it speak for so many people this morning, you've touched their lives as well. Lord, I'm thankful that you're relatable, that you can feel my infirmities, my frailties, the fears. But Lord, help us not to neglect what you've given to us. Lord, because you're sympathetic to us, that we can pray and access your power. I wonder this morning if you're here and you say, Pastor, while you spoke, God spoke to me. Pastor, while you spoke, the Lord touched my heart. Maybe there's been some thoughts in your mind, boy, I've been in all, all this alone. No one understands how I feel. No one knows what I'm going through. Well, my friend Jesus does. No one understands the fears I face. No one knows the pain of the loss. Jesus does. I would say, Pastor, would you pray for me this morning while you spoke? God spoke to me. God touched my heart. And I want to respond to him. Who's that? I would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? Slip your hand up, slip back down. Amen. 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 Hands all over. Who else? I wonder if you're here this morning. And I wonder if you're here and you don't know that if you died today, you'd go to heaven. You've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. But there's something going on inside you, perhaps. And you say, Pastor, boy, I, I don't know that I've ever trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, but I'd like to know how. But when you pray for the others, would you pray for me? I'll draw no more attention to you than I did anyone else. But would you slip your hand up? I'd love to pray for you this morning. You say, Pastor, that's me. I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? Just slip it up and slip back down. We'll see it. Lord, I thank you for this time. Lord, thank you that you are sympathetic. You're relatable. Lord, thank you for those who you've touched. I pray you'd help us to respond, Lord, like you've touched us. Lord, bless this invitation. If there's someone here or online who's never trusted you as their Savior, Lord, would you help them to come to you today to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.